So welcome again. <laughs> this is the proposal for the International Chronic Society, ICS. And just to be clear, this is a working title, just like many of the things in the presentation are to be seen as a proposal only. Right? I'm not here to come up with any sort of final solutions, but rather I'm here to start a discussion. And a discussion for which I think it's really about time. So, what, where do we stand at the moment? In my feeling, chronics at the moment is experiencing a second spring. Uh, the reception in the media has been getting more and increasingly positive. We heard Max talk about that uh, yesterday. Uh, ben uh, referred to chronics springing up all over the world. <coughs> and it seems that people are just you know, it's becoming more commonplace, it's seen as more acceptable. Uh, of course, I only know like the small local Sweden in which I'm uh, active. I didn't know about chronics in India at all, for example. But I know that uh, recently, just in uh, uh, Swiss and German televisions, there have been quite uh, favorable documentaries, even uh, a drama, I think a Swiss police series, Patrick, right? Yes, one of the most popular yeah. crime. Series. And another one, uh, another uh, yeah, document, one hour documentary covering, uh, well, basically new technologies and chronics in particular will actually air this Wednesday in uh, a very well renowned German uh, Austrian documentary channel. Marcus actually was also interviewed for that. Um, and this leads to an increasing public awareness and acceptance of chronics. One thing which I found very interesting was in, uh, and a good example of this was a study uh, published in 2014 by Kaiser et al, um, where they asked about uh, attitudes and acceptance towards the technology of chronics in Germany. And 22% of respondents answered that they could imagine having their bodies chronized after their deaths. So this is how they translated this question. It was actually a German, uh, well, a survey. And Obviously, there's lots of things which Max would object to here, like having their bodies after their deaths. So not very good language. Um, and I wouldn't read too much into that. I think it's more of a statement of intent, right? I mean, obviously, we're not going to have 50 million sign-ups in Germany anytime soon. But I think it just shows that people are willing to think about this, to actually consider this as a possibility. And also, We've seen lots happening here at this conference. <coughs> um, many new organizations have been set up in recent years. And the established ones have grown. Uh, we have quite a few, um, <coughs> very many nations present here at this conference. I've put a couple of flags up here. I hope I didn't miss anyone. <laughs> and Yesterday, the country presentations, I was deeply impressed by the range of activities and ideas <coughs> that were presented. For example, I uh, was very happy to learn of the great stuff which you guys are planning in Spain and the sort of traction you've gained even within uh, university hospitals and within society. I was also very much impressed by the engineering know-how which uh, we saw with, uh, with Cryofin. Um, the demonstration by Cryonics uh, UK yesterday, I really liked the new uh, perfusion system, for example, with the pressure regulation. So it was a, uh, a significant advance I wasn't aware of today. Also, of course, Netherlands, um, which uh, yeah, demonstrated that they have quite, quite a large uh, variety of equipment and so on, and lots of dedicated people. And this is just to name a few I can think of up the top. Oh, and of course, CryoSwiss, which basically out of nowhere organized this conference and is already a very uh, recognized uh, organization. And all of you others which uh, came here, presented or working at Cryonics, I thought this was really astonishing, something really cool. But there was one downside. I only learned about it yesterday, right? This is, uh, and this is a, uh, something I've experienced many times when we all get together, we talk and suddenly there's all these new ideas and somebody's got a new idea for an ice bath technology or for cool down or some good uh, examples for cooperating with local hospices <coughs> or hospitals. But there's like no regular forum where this sort of stuff gets exchanged. And I think that should change. And that's why I believe now is the time to coordinate and work together in an effective fashion. 
what we've seen so far and what we also heard yesterday is that many of the organizations have started talking to each other bilaterally, exchanging ideas, working together, going to trainings, covering cases. <coughs> um, so what we see between the different countries is yeah, people start to talk, right? And the more people, so there's all these bilateral communications happening. And I, you know, I just got tired of drawing <laughs> errors. <It's laughs> there would be even more errors, but I'm sure you get, you, know, you get the picture, right? And this is not, I mean, it's a great start, but it's not effective. Wouldn't it be much easier to have this? Yes. And with that, I want sort of, this was my opening yeah. gambit. I want to say, to the, start into the heart of the talk and saying that I believe that uh, an international chronic society, by whatever name, has provides several key benefits to the local organizations and to chronics. I've listed seven which I believe are like central here. They have public relations, trainings, collaborations with third parties, conferences, international services, best practice standards and procedures, and joint projects. So let me go into each of these in detail. Let's start with public relations. An international organization is perceived as more important it has a global standing, and it can refer to a larger membership base, which legitimizes it. If you're just a small organization like we are in Germany with 20 members, we don't have much standing. Who cares about 20 people? But think about 200 or 2,000. Then you have a lot more impact. You become a much more uh, recognized voice. Also, by coordinating messaging, all member organizations speak with one voice. Uh, especially journalists, research, international, uh, internationally, they look uh, at what has been published elsewhere. And sort of mixed messaging leads to the danger that we are not bringing across all central themes of medical time travel, of emergency medicine, across in a coordinated fashion. So I think this really helps each organization and helps their impact. Marketing materials can be researched and developed once and only need translation and localization. Uh, this especially um, concerns difficult topics, right? For example, tricky questions, for example, neuropride preservation, which is something many people feel initially uncomfortable with, or the topic of elective pride preservation, that is sort of combining cryonics with uh, suicide or assisted suicide. Now, let's look at training. This is something which has been happening uh, already sort of bottom up. Uh, yesterday, quite a few of the organizations said, well, we visited one of the Crownings UK trainings, or several, and we plan to do so going forward. And this allows a practical sharing of knowledge and experience. And I think it does even more, because team members that work together at a training establish trust and working relationship. And that's really important, because in an emergency situation, so much can go wrong. You need people you've worked with before, you, you know, you feel comfortable with. And over these training, with these trainings, you get together to build that uh, sort of uh, working relationship. Also, the an advantage is that with trainings, they confirm to international standards, right? That means everybody has used the UK ISPAL or tried out the FAST uh, Interossia system or worked with the Lucas Stumper. So. That, of course, makes working together much easier because people know the same equipment and know how to handle it. I think this is actually something which is especially uh, valuable for young organizations. They don't need to invent chronics from the ground up, and buy together some equipment, try to think of how to construct an ice bath, but they can see how it's done by Alcor, by Chronics Institute, by Chronics UK, and work to, uh, towards these standards. Finally, I think that in coordinating this sort of thing internationally, um, you're, uh, makes it possible to optimize the regional and temporal coverage, right? Because let's say we want to, uh, we have trainings outside of the UK. We had one in Utrecht last year, which was great because it allowed access to uh, many people who, uh, which were geographically closer to that. And this sort of thing can be optimized if we think together what would be a good place to conduct a training. Let's look at collaborations with third parties. 
as mentioned before, with public relations, an international organization simply has a much bigger scale. This means uh, we'll be able to get better support from the standing players. For example, just a small organization who asks Max, hey, can we have one of those med kits as well? Max is like, guys, you're like the 30th person who's asked this month. So why don't we just send, let's say, three kits to Europe and distribute them at strategically useful uh, locations, right? So that makes this sort of coordination much easier. But also with parties external to parties to uh, procure medicine and supplies. It's much easier if you do so on a bulk level and somebody, only one person needs to research the supplier. If you want to get endorsement from public figures, they'll feel much more comfortable working together with an organization which they perceive to be large and important. If you want to associate with other top level organizations, let's say the International Society of Funeral Directors, they don't want to <coughs> set up relationships with 20 different groups, but it would like one single party which is able to coordinate them eye to eye. And of course for research collaborations, where also just simply the scale we have allows us uh, to bring more to the table and to be more interesting for them. Let's look at conferences. We're actually at a conference just now. And so far, just like this one, conferences have been organized dynamically by local organizations. This is really cool, and we can see what, uh, and I'm really impressed by the level of professionalism and the speakers which Credit Suisse was able uh, to get uh, together here. However, it does mean that there is no coordinated schedule, there is no established format, and also, um, yeah, learnings from this organization. I mean, Credit Suisse, you, you know, I heard there's a list already saying, okay, this is stuff we could do even better, right? This sort of stuff won't get passed on to other organizations. So each local organization sort of starts anew. And by having a central um, well, body coordinating that sort of thing, it makes sure we have like, there's like forward momentum. There's reliability in getting this stuff done. There's consistent goals. And the learnings can be transformed into steady improvement. And also by having a regular format, the conference attains better branding because it's under the same title. And this, in turn, attracts high-profile speakers. You can see that in the scientific world, right? These like, hugely successful conference series, which go on from year to year to year, simply because people know the brand. You know, This is the place to be to discuss all things on regenerative medicine. Or Aubrey, of course, who runs a very successful series of sense conferences. If each of these was a one-off, we would have much more trouble attracting high-profile speakers. Now let's come to <coughs> benefit number five, international services. And I think this is really key. Uh, I mean, even if you discount all the other things, this alone makes a very strong case for international uh, coordination. Because by pooling resources, the chronic organizations are able to offer much more and more reliable services to their members in case of an emergency. If by having this sort of global coordination, you can have a global disposition of available and trained personnel in the standby. A small organization could never pull off a proper standby all by itself. And we've seen this already with uh, cases uh, in Crownix UK for volunteers for, I mean, I know some from Germany, there might have been others who came over to assist with individual cases. This is still in its infancies, but as the case volume increases, it means that it allows much better coverage because you have a much larger pool. Let's say you have three physicians, many of them will be busy in their day job, but at least there's a good chance that one of them would be available, or one person who really knows perfusion. So by having this sort of global pool of people who have the, uh, share the know-how, you're, uh, be able to, you're able to serve the needs of the individual cases much better. Also, it helps with equipment and with medications and with perfusion solutions. Uh, Europe, for example, is not that big, right? Uh, stuff can be transported to neighboring countries in, some, uh, in a matter of a few hours. So if you have at least a day or two advance morning, that means you can move the equipment there. And it does, means you don't have to replicate the whole stash of medication and so on in each country. And Alco has already done that with Roland Brothers in London, where they have the med kit which they can fly on and uh, the solutions. And I think that sort of thing really becomes really important. I mean, think, think of the United States. Ludicrous is each 
of the 50 states in the US had their own Keranix providers. It simply doesn't make sense. And it allows the sharing of technology, for example, alarm systems which uh, measure the pulse. And uh, you only need to maintain a single hotline. Then you can even invest a bit more money, make sure there's a professional organization behind it with 24 7 availability. And this can serve all of the member organizations together. Let's look at best practices in standards and procedures. What we've seen is that each organization has their own local network of experts, which, are, which have like very different capabilities. We saw, I mentioned before, the engineering know-how uh, we have in Finland. Some of the organizations have NDs working uh, as their members, others don't. So uh, then there's, in some days, like more scientists, so you have like all these people from different uh, specializations, and they're not distributed evenly. But by pooling the resources and by sharing the expertise and learnings, we can develop best practice standards and procedures for all the member organizations. Actually, procedures and equipment are very similar in the different countries. And it doesn't make sense for every group to develop their own manuals and their own protocols. I think here it would be really easy to set up a sort of central repository, for example, a wiki, which documents high staff designs, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, sources for medications and equipment, standard inventory lists. And all of the stuff the different organizations have, it's just not distributed evenly. And in that way, and uh, this sort of refers to what I said earlier, if you have common standards, it also makes sharing of equipment and bulk orders much easier. And finally, of course, as is always the case with cryonics, unexpected things happen, right? There's new challenges to solve. And in that way, we can <coughs> solve the global pool of experts instead of just uh, asking around in our own organization. Finally, let's look at joint projects. <coughs> I think this is a no-brainer. Big uh, projects need big resources. As you can see here, the edifice of a temple doesn't rest on a single column. Many columns need to support it, and many columns together are able to uh, lift much uh, bigger projects than any single one. So by collaborating and pooling resources, we can realize large and impactful projects. Working together also ensures that these projects are relevant to all the member organizations, because they're all involved in the design. We can say, OK, this is something which is really useful, or they can say, OK, that doesn't make any sense to me. And then maybe the project, we should rethink the project. So in summary, a single powerful organization can more easily contribute to large international projects and initiatives. One example we saw here uh, a couple of times was the Organ Preservation Alliance. Right? This is a large organization with quite a bit of traction. And if we want to sort of understand what they're doing and how Tronix can profit from that, we would be able to do so much easier with a single point of contact than each organization by itself. They are my students. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, uh, I want to summarize and add a couple of additional uh, uh, tangible benefits, which uh, I think come on top of this. These are like a bit more ide idealistic, but I think in no way less important. Uh, the first one is the collective identity. I believe that having a common source of reference in a shared identity provides support and vision. You have a sort of <coughs> common DNA which then strengthens the common cause. <coughs> There's also the issue of branding. We live in an ever more globalized world, and a single distinctive brand is really important for recognition and impact. I think many of you know Humanity Plus. If I were to do a quiz, we can say, what are the names of the individual tra transhumanist organizations in Europe? I think a couple of you would know a few of them. But most of you who are in the transhumanist space know Humanity Plus. And I think this is a good example that shows you that having a single global brand is just a focal point for recognition and for focusing discourse. Is it C minus? Hmm? Is it C minus? C minus, H minus or C minus? C minus, H plus, C minus, Krynix. Oh, yeah. uh, I think we'll have to rethink that one. <laughs> 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 
not least because there's so many programmers within Cryon. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the final point I think is one of the most interesting. This was uh, actually a point which uh, was suggested by Google, which I would never have thought of, but I think it's a very valid, very good point. He says that working together also creates a sort of productive tension. Right? Instead of working independently from each other and in isolation, the member organizations through such uh, an international organization are forced to remain in contact. So there's like a constant tension between international standards and local adaptation. And this tension drives productive development and challenges the members to improve. And you can look at this goldfish here. He suddenly has a new idea. He wants to jump into a different path, uh, pond. And if they, if they did that in isolation, it would be great. Like nobody else would notice. But look at all these goldfish here. They're going to be wondering, why is this guy over there? Is there something we are missing? <laughs> so let me come to sort of the proposal, or sort of the proposal for a proposal. What I think <laughs> is that what we need at the moment is an umbrella organization of independent local organizations. What I know from personal experience, and I think many of you know as well, Kronosis tend to be individualists with a strong drive for independence. And this is reflected in their organizations. I think that the global hierarchical organization, and I've heard this proposed uh, from uh, various angles, that this would stifle local growth, and especially it would stifle ownership. Mm -hmm. Also, the laws and the situations are different in each country, so you need some sort of different local setups. There's legal restrictions, which necessitate uh, bespoke legal setups. And there's also countries with right to die laws, like the Netherlands and Belgium, with, uh, or Switzerland, and other countries that don't have it, like Germany. <coughs> so this comes with its own set of opportunities and challenges. So this umbrella organization, in it the member societies would retain extensive freedoms, but profit from significant synergies. And I think that's really what we would be looking for at the moment. But it doesn't mean that the umbrella organization it needs to be more than just a loose network or let's all set up a mailing list, right? It needs commitment and it needs structure. So what we're looking at is a society, uh, an organization where there's effort and commitment from all the members. And the thing you should always remember, the umbrella organization is there to serve you as local organizations, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Also, we as a team, we're proposing this, see ourselves only as facilitators, not as leaders imposing our own ideas. That's why I've been deliberately vague around the scope, around the setup or everything, because I think that such a society will only be successful if the local organizations support it, take ownership, and it's developed in a shared effort. So what we propose is an open dialogue to define the scope and the processes of such an organization. And let me be clear, we know that there's pros and cons. I mean, there's certainly a bit of overhead, there's more coordination. So, uh, however, I do believe that over the long term, such an organization will become natural and necessary. And then the question is, at what point do we really sort of, uh, yeah, grab the nettle and go for it? And to summarize, I think at the moment we see a remarkable development of economics. The strong established organizations and upswell of new organizations and all time high interest and acceptance. So we believe that now is exactly the right time to take this next step. And we hope that you will join us. Now you may ask yourself, how did this even come about, right? Uh, who's behind this? So I thought I'd take just one slide to introduce the team as it is so far. Uh, so this is uh, Hubert, who, as Patrick mentioned, unfortunately, uh, because of illness, was not able to join us this weekend, but who's been a very important force in putting this together. Udo, whom you've just met before, and myself. Um, I'd like to say a few words to each of us so you get to know uh, us a bit more, in case you don't. So uh, Hubert uh, works as CEO and president of a Swiss investment management company. And he's been with uh, Trio Swiss pretty much from the start and is responsible for strategic and organizational matters. And uh, he did quite a lot of uh, <coughs> work of this in his academic career. 
Then uh, Udo Schieffer, who you know, owns an insurance agency. Uh, he's also the finance director for Crimex Germany. And uh, he has extensive uh, experience with, uh, well, organizations dedicated to cutting-edge technology <laughs> because he's the vice president of uh, the Porsche Club in Munich. And he's also liaison to the Porsche Club Germany, which is the sort of, uh, well, umbrella organization. So he knows very well the structure of how this sort of thing works. And finally, myself, I am the chief risk officer for a cloud lending startup. And uh, one of the so founders uh, of the German Cryonics movement. And uh, I currently function as a sort of international liaison as well for Cryonics Germany. And this is a team, I mean, we three sat together in a workshop based on what we would like to do. We said, you know, this is something we really want to initiate, something we want to push forward. And so we thought about how can we make this happen? What should we do? And this is what we've come up with so far. But this is a team of, well, three people. And I think that uh, to move something as big, we would need more people to push this along. So as, uh, yeah, I'm basically asking for volunteers. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also certainly approach some of you uh, in the hope that you'll support this as sort of facilitators and organizers. And of course, I don't want to end with this, but rather with an outlook to how could we get to such an organization. So what do we have here? The proposal of next steps. Uh, the first one, and this is the most important, is the feedback from you. We'll have a discussion uh, around now. And basically, at this conference, we wanted to test the waters, right? We think this is the right time. But the question is, do you think this is the right time? Or what do the other local organizations think? Is this worthwhile considering? Is it something they want to push forward? So we want to use this as a sounding board. If we proceed forward, if there's enough interest, we want to assign from each organization that takes part a liaison who will work with us through the process and interface between sort of the setup, the uh, proto-umbrella organization, and the local organization. And we want to supplement the organizing team so that this rests on our shoulders. We then think we should conduct a survey to understand the needs and requirements of each of the member organizations and agree on the goals of the umbrella organization so we know what makes sense and what we're working towards. Then we'll start a process which we think could take around six months where we together develop the umbrella organization using an online group and video conferences to interface to decide on a name, on the scope, structure and processes, the mode, how we want to work together, and of course some sort of formalized bylaws which uh, put this into writing. We then think it would make sense to have an international workshop where we finalize all of this, where each of the liaisons participate, and uh, together we agree on some sort of proposal we take to the member organizations. And then, of course, the proposal would need to be ratified by all of the organizations that want to take part. And I believe that if we are successful in this, this will set the stage for a new era in the development of Chronics. Because I think this is the first time this sort of thing has been attempted. So well, uh, we are aware that it's quite a big ask and quite an ambitious goal. But I think one that is well worthwhile and one which we should aspire to achieve. So. Thank you for your time and for your interest, and let's move to questions. Thank you.